Hey everybody, Michael the Librarian of Magic here, finding and cataloging the magical and pointing you to it. Today is November the 12th and Disney Plus has launched today. Now I have spent a good chunk of time today watching pretty much all of the original content uh, that Disney has included on launch day. And I'm here to uh, give you some of my impressions and uh, I guess sort of quickie reviews on most of the content. Um, there will be a few things that I won't specifically be talking about in this video and I'll let you know what those are right off the top just to save you some time if there are specific things you are looking for. In this video I will be talking about all of the original Disney Plus content with the exception of The Mandalorian, uh, the films Noel and the live action Lady and the Tramp. Um, I'm going to talk about those in their own separate videos, uh, probably record and post those tomorrow. Um, they, I feel like they w just warrant uh, a lot more discussion and um, you know, I need to take some more time to watch them and digest them, digest them and that sort of thing. But I will be giving you my impressions of literally everything else that is original that was put on Disney Plus day one. Before I get into all of that stuff, just a quick word about my experience so far with the service. It looks really great. It's really easy to navigate. Um, the menus are familiar as they are with any other streaming service, but um, it looks really nice. I like how it's categorized into, you know, Star Wars, Pixar, Marvel. It's sort of what you want from your experience um, if you are a fan of all this stuff. Also, um, there you, you may have read already the, uh, going around the internet that there were big time hiccups this morning when the service first launched and that it was pretty much just straight up down. Uh, the servers were just pretty much kaput and weren't you know, people weren't getting through to the service at all. That was true in my case as well, but I feel like Disney really did a good job of course correcting even though they did a seemingly poor job of estimating um, how much uh, traffic and demand they would be getting and and launching that in the first place but some of those things some of those technical things can be unavoidable and like I said I feel like they did a really good job of course correcting for it um, where I live, I'm in the mountain time zone in the United States, and uh, the service dropped in my area at 4 a.m. this morning. I was able to get up and start um, messing around with the service at about 6 o'clock this morning, my time, and uh, was able to log in, and it sent me right to the... Um, sort of home page, the home interface. And I was able to navigate through all the menus and look at all of the um, sub menus and all that sort of thing, but I was unable to view any sort of content at all. Whenever I would try to click on um, any sort of show or movie or anything like that, it would say that the content was unavail temporarily unavailable. Um, and then I sort of fiddled with that for about a half an hour and then just sort of logged off and logged back in completely. And when I tried to log back in, it just wouldn't even let me log in. I got um, what uh, you may have heard described on the internet is just sort of a, a we can't even load Disney Plus at this time screen that had uh, an astronaut Mickey and Pluto on it. Um, and I, I uh, just couldn't get through it all for probably a couple of hours, maybe until about eight o'clock or nine o'clock in the morning. I sort of would do other things, do, do other work and then periodically check on it. But I would say within a few hours, probably no later than 10, uh, I had the service up and running and was able to start watching content. Within the first hour of watching the content, there were some buffering hiccups here and there um, where things would kind of stall out and then it would skip back about 30 seconds and then play forward. It didn't happen a lot. It only happened occasionally, probably once per show that I watched. The first two or three shows that I watched, it was like once per and then after that i had absolutely no problems with the service whatsoever and i feel like as the day went on traffic had to have only increased um i i had my best experience of the of the day watching it probably about 3 or 3 30 my time which is already five o'clock on the east coast 5 30 on the east coast and so there's probably a lot more people logging on a lot more people watching the service and um it, it was running like a dream for me. 
Um, I can't speak for everybody. There may still be some negative experiences out there, but I've been having a really great experience with it considering that it's day one and I expected there to be some traffic issues and some hiccups. I should also say that I live in an area where I don't uh, really have a personal dedicated um, internet service, like an internet uh, line or ISP. I, I um, live in an area where there are a couple of internet service providers, but everybody that lives in my immediate neighborhood is sort of sharing off the same bandwidth. So that has caused us problems in the past with other services um, that are having high traffic issues like Netflix or Amazon. I had absolutely no problem with with that considering my uh, internet service. Everything was running like a dream, like I said. There may be some more hiccups this evening when it gets to be prime time in my neck of the woods and there's a lot more people in my area logging on. It's not just day, daytime traffic. That may be a problem, I don't know yet, but as far as the daytime traffic from, you know, nine o'clock all the way till about three in the afternoon, everything was running perfectly. I mean, I wasn't watching 100% consistently that whole time, but periodically throughout the day as I was working on digesting the content and doing some other work, it was working for me every single time. So that's just my general thoughts about the experience of it all. I know that there were some hiccups, like I said, for a lot of customers, and I wanted to just talk about my experience right off the top. So with that being said, I like I said at the beginning of this, I did get to view Basically all of the original content, with the exception of the movies and The Mandalorian, which I'll do on other videos. So I'm just going to go through those, talk a little bit about what they are and um, what I thought of them. You can decide if that's something that you want to watch or if that sounds like it'd be up your alley or if that's right for you. Um, I hope that this will be informative in that way. These aren't in any particular order. I really just wrote them down in the order in which I watched them, which was kind of random based on navigating the the service so i'm going to start first with uh i've got my handy dandy notebook here with my scar and mike wazowski on it and it's got a cool like lenticular game boy thing on there anyway um so I'm going to start with the Pixar Spark Shorts. This is a series of short Pixar films that are original for Disney+. Plus. They um, are sort of side projects of people who work at Pixar. They were This is a project that they spearheaded for Disney+, Plus just to give more um, various variety of creative voices at Pixar a chance to make some short films and work on things that they wanted to work on and some more passion projects. There are four up on the um, on Disney Plus right now, and I have to imagine that they're probably going to keep adding to those. I don't think this is going to be a limited project. I It didn't feel that way, but um, who knows? There, there are four on there right now. Uh, the four are um, called Float, Kit Bull, Smash and Grab, and Pearl. Um, Float is a short film directed and written by a guy named Bobby Rubio, who is a uh, Filipino-American artist at Pixar, and it is sort of an autobiographical um, short film that was inspired by his son Alex, who is on the autism spectrum. And the short film is basically about a guy whose son is different, and in the, uh, the difference that the son has in the short film is that... Uh, one day as an infant or a toddler, he mysteriously develops the ability to float around in the air. And um, the short film is really very touching and moving. Um, it really gets at what, par what uh, parents struggle with when they have a child who's different and um, how they go through the growing pains of um, loving their child and then struggling with the way that society views their child and the way that makes them feel and then ultimately coming back to understanding and accepting their child and um, you know it's just very uh, beautiful uh, film that to me of, of the four short films it was the one that had the most to say and it was the, the most uh, poignant I felt but um, done in the tr traditional Pixar style of animation um, and just a, a very sweet short film. The the movie or the short film Kit Bull was written and directed by Roseanne Sullivan at Pixar, and this one was an, it was actually kind of interesting as part of this project because it is uh, 2D hand drawn hand 
painted animation, which is not something that Pixar re really ever does. In fact, this may be the first time they've ever done that. It tells the story of a alley cat astray in the Mission District in San Francisco who ends up befriending a junkyard pit bull who is a really sweet dog but is trying to be trained by its owners to um, be mean and aggressive and they're very abusive to it. So um, it does, if you're an animal lover, if you're a pet lover, especially if you're a pit bull lover, um, this short film will be very touching to you. If you're a cat lover, it's very cute. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's not, it doesn't have a particular depth per se, but it is a very sweet uh, story about two animals who find each other. And um, it was, uh, the animation style is uh, what's uh, really notable in that one. The third film is a short film called Smash and Grab, but written and directed by a guy called Brian Larson. Uh, this one incorporated a lot of motion capture elements, uh, for what I understand, in creating the characters. It's about two robots that live in sort of a futuristic, uh, somewhere out in outer space colony where they're mining some sort of um, resource. They're, they're One of them basically chunks it out and they're tied together. One of them chunks it out and the other one uh, grabs it from him. And they're trying to escape their mundane existence. So they just have to do the same thing over and over again, and they figure out how to try to escape from their monotony, basically. Uh, again, this one is not super duper, ha have a super amount of depth to it or anything like that. Not that they have to. Um, but it's also very sweet and uh, very interesting to look at. If you are a sci-fi or robot fan, you may find that pretty a pretty charming little film. The final um, uh, short film that I watched that's on this uh, Spark Shorts project is called Pearl, P-U-R-L, by Kristen Lester. And Pearl was a really interesting one, actually. I felt like it was sort of the most lighthearted of the bunch in, and kind of silly, but also tackling the topic of um, gender equality and diversity in the workplace. Um, it's really about a pink ball of yarn who goes to work at sort of a male-dominated office, nondescript office building, um, and her sort of struggle to fit in there and decide whether or not, you know, how far she wants to go in order to fit in with the guys or to, to be herself, and it's sort of about that struggle um, and how to either fit into the office culture or try to change the office culture and all that sort of stuff. This one I thought was kind of notable in that it sort of, um, I felt like pushed the content envelope for Disney Pixar in terms of um, and uh, what they're putting into their animated uh, short films or, or films in general, um, because this was a short film that was clearly not made for um, children. It was made for an adult audience. It deals with the adult themes of like I said, um, being in the workplace and gender inequality. Um, and as, as a result, there are some really um, off-color jokes that are featured in this short film, as well as um, some minor adult language, but the type of language that would never be featured in a regular Pixar film. So it, it is actually very striking to see even a short film made by Pixar that um, uses that sort of those sort of language and metaphor and and touching on those sort of themes. It was very amusing and um, definitely worth a watch. Uh, so of those, I would say um, Float and Pearl were the ones that stuck out to me most. But I really enjoyed the other two. I thought Kit Bull was very cute. Um, Smash and Grab was the one that sort of least got my attention, but it was still enjoyable to watch. So those are Spark the Spark Shorts short films. After that, I watched uh, Forky Asks a Question, which is a very short form series. It was only a couple of minutes long, and I'm assuming they'll come back with one of these each week where Forky asks a, asks a different question. Forky from the character from Toy Story 4, the spork that comes to life, and in this series is vo voiced by Tony Hale, who voiced Forky in Toy Story 4, and many people know as uh, Buster Bluth in Arrested Development. In this episode, he asks a question, what is money? And Ham, the piggy bank, teaches Forky a little lesson about what money is, and it's very humorous and very silly. Tony Hale is great, and it's it's a great few minutes, and I'm actually um, 
this is just sort of a nice, fun little five-minute thing to watch. It's not a huge depth of content or anything like that, but it is really fun and it, it is um, well made and amusing. I enjoyed. I really did enjoy it. After that, I watched the Marvel Hero Project. This is the sh a short half an hour ish documentary series that focuses on a a young person. Um, probably in each episode. In this episode, it focused on a young lady named Jordan Reeves, who lives in Missouri. She um, was born uh, differently limbed. She uh, only has uh, part of one of her arms. And um, she, uh, in, in growing up with that and figuring out how to navigate um, all of those different you know, how to, how to do things differently. Um, she eventually went to a, uh, technical conference, um, in San Francisco when she was 10, I think, and, um, invented a glitter cannon that could attach to her arm and, um, that it started this thing called Project Unicorn, which just sort of went viral and inspired a lot of other people like her. And she and her mother eventually started basically going around the country as advocates for other people with similar disabilities and um, sort of starting these think tanks for young people that want to try to come up with ideas that can um, really push the future of accessibility and, um, uh, you know, disability awareness and all that sort of stuff, like how to... Um, have all of those different perspectives from people who actually have disabilities to um, come up with ideas that can, you know, enhance accessibility and enhance our world in general because they have a, a different point of view because some of, some people have to live their lives differently than other people do. So um, she has a really inspirational story about how, you know, now that she's in like 13 years old that she's um, come up with all these ideas and basically has become a young inventor and um, goes to all of these conferences in the country and has had, you know, TED Talk and all sorts of stuff like that. And uh, Marvel has decided to make her a, a Marvel hero. And they drew part of the in this show, the way it works, why it's the Marvel Hero Project, is they find these interesting people and their, their interesting backstories and, you know, these interesting young people. And then um, draw them in their own comic book and turn them into Marvel heroes and sort of recruit them into the Marvel hero project squad, basically. And um, it's a really, it, there's a, uh, um, she's a really inspiring person. And I'm sure each uh, person in the, in each episode will be. And it's interesting to see their story and how they, um, you know, what, what they do that makes them special and unique. And um, yeah, it wasn't like, mind-blowing or anything like that but if you um are interested in these sorts of stories and uh, of you know human adversity or um people doing heroic things i would actually recommend it i think it is inspiring i think it, um the the person in in the um videos is is an inspiring um uh, person and um it, it, it was a it was a cool little twist with the Marvel thing to add that she was drawn in her own comic book and all that sort of stuff. And uh, more more importantly, I think for this specific person, um, Jordan in the movie um, or in this particular episode, rather, uh, that uh, she's specifically highlighting uh, things about accessibility for people with disabilities. And the more of that we, we have in our world, the better. So I think um, that show is interesting. Um, I won't be waiting on bated breath for um, every episode, but I'm sure that I'll enjoy them when they come out. And, uh, you know, it's not something that's high on my viewing list, but I'm really happy that it exists. I wasn't disappointed with it. And I think it's really cool. And if it serves to inspire anybody out there to think differently or to, to feel empowered um, about, you know, their own lives and their own situations, I'm totally all for it. I think it was pretty cool. After that, I watched a, um, there's a, a show, I guess you could say, called Disney Family Sundays, which is another very short sort of five, six minute uh, content piece where it, it uh, is hosted by um, Amber Camp Gerstel, and she's uh, sort of a crafts person, a crafts maven, and 
Uh, it focuses on a family, and I'm assuming they'll pick a different family in each episode. This one had the My Family, a mom, a dad, and a daughter. And they did a sort of do-it-yourself craft, making a Dumbo tent out of uh, a bed canopy thing and making it sort of circus-themed and um, putting the girl's name on it. And they, they, they show you what supplies you would need to do it, and if you want to replicate it in your home, this would be a great uh, little thing if it whenever it comes out weekly for families if they wanted to do some sort of activity and actually have some sort of content on the um channel that actually has you doing something and making something and i think that's re a really cool aspect of it again it's another short little thing it was only sort of a five or six minute um piece but it was really cool to check out and just you know it'll be interesting to see as they go along what sort of craft projects are on there the um, Dumbo tent canopy thing wasn't something that I would be interested in making for myself. It obviously is not was not geared towards me in particular. But I can imagine there may be a craft or two throughout a season worth that I may want to do or may want to sit down with my wife and do that would be enjoyable to do. So that's a cool thing that's on there. After that, I watched uh, Pixar in Real Life, which was also very short. But this, I thought, was very amusing. Uh, the concept is that... Uh, Disney creates some sort of real life um, something or other from a Pixar film and then they put it out somewhere in public and then people interact with it. So in this first episode, uh, they created an inside out like emotions console um, that, you know, sort of like the thing that controls the girl's brain in the movie Inside Out and they put it in Washington Square Park in New York. And then uh, people would come up and sort of fiddle with the controls and they weren't sure if they would do anything. And then uh, Disney had had, unbeknownst to the people who were messing, you know, public people who were messing with the machine, Disney had actors that would sort of walk in and out. And if people pushed the different emotional buttons on there, they would sort of be acting with each other, acting a scene. And if the person pushed the button, um, the console would glow in the front to show the, the actors what sort of emotion that they should be responding to. And then they would... Um, you know, change their emotions in the scene and sort of give the people who were messing with the machine the illusion that they were controlling their emotions. And it was it was actually really amusing to see people react to it and see people mess with it and just sort of an interesting way to bring Pixar to life. I thought it was a really, really magical idea and um, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, it was a very short segment, but it was really cool, sort of like a man on the street sort of piece. But I'm excited to actually see what they do with that. Just fun little ideas that they make throughout the season of that. That's Pixar in real life. I thought that was really fun. After that, I watched the Imagineering Story, which is a long-form documentary style. Uh, I won't say it's a show. I think it's a long-form documentary in parts, sort of an episodic miniseries. This was uh, directed by Leslie Iwerks, who is a... Um, known documentarian, she um, was nominated for an Emmy for making the documentary The Pixar Story, and she also made a documentary called uh, Re Recycled Life, which uh, was nominated for an Academy Award. She also happens to be the daughter of Disney legend Don Iwerks and the granddaughter of Disney legend of Iwerks, who co-created Mickey Mouse and uh, Oswald the Lucky Rabbit. This uh, series, the first episode was called The Happiest Place on Earth, and it's sort of um, it was about an hour long and a little over an hour, and it sort of documents the birth of Disneyland and the Imagineering department. And sort of, I mean, I, the the idea behind the documentary is the story of where the Imagineers came from and what they've done throughout their life in Disney. And so this first episode was about the foundation of the Imagineers, and their first project was creating Disneyland. And so there's a lot of, you know, what what they did there. There are a lot of people, uh, the people that are uh, that were, were working then that are still alive now are featured in the documentary, and that's really cool to see. Uh, people like Bob Sherman, who um, still writes music for Disney and is um, a wonderful Disney legend, and a bunch of other people too. Uh, there were a lot of really touching, sentimental moments of people just reflecting on their time with Walt, and it was interesting to see reactions of people who actually knew Walt Disney and... Um, how they were inspired by him and and just sort of talking about what sort of man he was and um, how he worked and those sorts of things were very interesting. And there's also a lot of behind the scenes stuff about how they developed audio animatronics for things like Pirates of the Caribbean, how they came up with the Matterhorn, how they created that. Uh, it's a small world. 
a lot of features in the park, pretty much how they built Disneyland and what it, what it took to get there. Uh, my only, I wouldn't say a criticism, but my only wish for this show, uh, from for me personally, is that it it there's not enough depth for me. Uh, I'm sort of nerdy about this sort of stuff, so it just was one of those. It covered a lot of ground in an hour. It sort of went through the whole birth of Disneyland, even all the way up to Walt Disney World in the 70s and past the death of Walt Disney. Um, but as they were going through each segment, they would it would sort of give five or ten minutes on, uh, here's what they took to develop the audio animatronics for um, conversations with Mr. Lincoln, and then uh, how, that, how that eventually evolved into making... Um, animatronics for the Enchanted Tiki Room and the Pirates of the Caribbean. For me personally, I could have an entire episode just about Pirates of the Caribbean, the history of that, what it took to make that. You could definitely put in that level of detail. Um, and maybe that wouldn't be for everybody. If, if you don't know a lot about this sort of stuff and you are uh, remotely interested, this will be a good primer for you. I think this is a good show for people who are just... Um, cursorily interested or they want sort of a um, overview of Imagineering and the Disney parks and and some of the history of Walt Disney and that sort of thing. If that's you, I think you're really going to like this. It's really well made. I think I do think that Leslie Iwerks did a great job. Um, it's just for my, you know, Disney nerd self, I felt like, man, I just, I would want to, every time something would go by, they'd stop talking about it. And I felt like, oh, I want to know more about that. I, you could go into so much depth about this, that, and the other. So, um, that's just for me, but I, I enjoyed watching it. I thought it was really well, uh, made, well shot, and the interviews are really great. And there's a lot of touching stuff in there. I especially enjoyed, like I said before, the interviews with people who actually knew Walt and their reactions about him, I thought really made the whole thing worth a watch, regardless of your level of fandom or what you know or don't know about the Imagineers and Disney parks. I think that's totally worthwhile. After that, I watched High School Musical, the musical, the series, which uh, some people have um, uh, bemoaned the title of the show, thinking it's kind of a silly title. I think it's actually smart. I enjoyed it. The, the title is silly on purpose because the show is like super duper meta. Um, it is a scripted show. It's not a documentary or, or a reality show or anything like that. It's a scripted show that takes place at the high, the, the idea behind the show, think if I can describe this, the idea behind the show is it takes place at the high school where the movie high school musical was shot. And the, there's a new, um, theater teacher there and she wants to put on a production. She, she used to be, she was one of the background dancers in the original high school musical movie. And she wants to put on her own production of high school musical at this school. And so it's about them auditioning for this first episode is called the auditions. And it's about the kids in the school auditioning for high school musical in the high school East high where high school musical was filmed. Um, and there's sort of some funny stuff here and there, like in the, um, in the high school musical movie, they're the East High Wildcats. In the show, they're the East High Leopards, saying, oh, we're not the Wildcats, they just changed that for the movie. Even though this is a fictional show, it's got all these weird meta things in it, but I thought it was actually highly amusing. The, the music and singing is really good. All the people involved are really talented, talented singers and dancers. And uh, if you're a fan at all of High School Musical, the, the movie series, I think you'll really, really enjoy this. Um, it's, it's, it it uh, is really aware of the High School Musical movie and is sort of telling a similar story. There's, you know, romance, budding romances and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's, it, that's another thing that makes it interesting is there's sort of the story they're telling is sort of parallel with the story that's told in High School Musical with some differences here and there, but... There's a lot of stuff that's really funny and really interesting. This is another show where I felt like a couple of times in the dialogue and in the content where they are pushing the envelope a little bit in terms of uh, who this is targeted at age-wise. I would say that they're being very intentional at targeting this at teens and older teens and young adults. Um, there is There are some bits of uh, language and themes and things like that here and there that... Um, I think are, for me personally, are perfectly fine, uh, but I also found it interesting. There are things in this show that I don't think they would have even included in the, on the Disney Channel or things in the original high school musical movies. That's just my opinion. Um, 
So High School Musical, the musical, the series, I thought that was, I actually enjoyed it. I've seen the first two High School Musical movies. I haven't seen the third one, but as somebody who's seen the movies and has picked up on some of the references that they got going in here, like I said, if you're a fan of those at all, I think you'll really enjoy this. I thought it was funny and interesting and I, you know, I wouldn't mind watching it just to see where it goes, although it's probably going to be pretty predictable. I don't think the plot is at, at, uh, the important thing here. I think it's the, the fact that it's meta and silly and funny and poking fun at itself and all of that stuff. So, uh, another funny thing that I noted when I was sort of looking, so each thing on, Di when you're watching the Disney uh, Plus originals or pretty much anything, some things have extras. There's like an extras menu whenever you, um, are deciding whether or not you want to play some show or movie. And sometimes there are deleted scenes or trailers or whatever. And, um, so for example, on the, the Sparkworks, the short Pixar films, there were like little making of documentaries that were like five minutes each. And I watched all of those. Um, the, one of the interesting things I noted for the extras on High School Musical, the musical, the series, which, uh, gives you an idea of sort of the tone that they're going for with this show was a trailer for the show, which was called High School Musical, the musical, the series, the trailer. And I thought that was actually pretty funny. Like I said, some people are annoyed by that, but I, I think it's kind of funny, and I, I think it fits with what they're going for. After that, I watched a show called Encore, which is a reality show, uh, I guess you could say hosted by Kristen Bell. I would call her more of an ambassador or like a really hands-on producer. It's not really a show that she's actively hosting. She doesn't do voiceovers or anything. She does an introduction and shows up later on towards the end. And that's not a knock on her at all. I think it works really well. Um, I think the idea behind it is that Kristen Bell is really, her presence is really there more for the people involved in the show than she is to to draw you and I in at home as viewers, if that makes sense. The The basis of the show is that they find a, each episode is that they find a um, high school production of some musical from some high school in America from the past, and then try to reunite all of those original cast members together to try to remount a one night only uh, production of the show that they had back in the day. So this one, um, finds the cast of a production of Annie from 1996 in a, a town called Santee, California, in Southern California. And it really uh, goes through, you know, these people reuniting with each other that haven't seen each other in a while and what their lives are like, what they do for a living, and what their families are like and all that stuff. And, and sort of the nerves about um, putting on this production. And they only have like five days to do it. So that's also a really interesting thing and trying to get themselves back up to speed. And some people have been singing since uh, school and some people haven't. And there's all those sort of interesting ins and outs and relationships and all that sort of stuff. I would say that this is a pretty niche show. If you were a theater kid, a theater geek in school, or a music geek in, in high school or something like that, I think this show is totally for you. I think you're really going to like it. I did. I was a, a music dork and a, a drama kid in school, and I really liked it. It was really appealing to me because, you know, I have had those experiences in my life. Um, if you're somebody that hasn't, I don't know how much this is going to appeal to you. You may find it interesting just as a slice of life or just to see... The reality show aspects of you know high school people being reunited and that sort of thing um that may be interesting to you if you're not a reality show person at all or you're not a um, musical theater person at all this is probably not going to be for you but if you are i think you're really going to like it uh, i really enjoyed it i think uh like my wife and my sister-in-law and my sister uh will really like this and um you know because i know that they have had background in this sort of thing too so if that's your sort of thing, I think you're really going to like it. It was very interesting and funny and touching at times, and I thought it was really well made um, and interesting. I'll be interested to see what other sorts of productions um, besides Annie are coming up in the future episodes. So that's one that I'm not going to have any problems with watching on into the future, but some people may not like it. Finally, I watched The World According to Jeff Goldblum, which was one that I highlighted in my Disney Plus preview video as something I was looking forward to, and I really think that this show delivered for what I was looking for. Um, it, Jeff Goldblum is just a really singular, idiosyncratic person. He's just a really unique guy and uh, amusing for it. 
And uh, this is not, I don't think this is, show is for everybody. Uh, I don't think it's a love it or hate it show. Um, but I do think it'll be polarizing, interestingly. Um, because I think Jeff Goldblum is just one of those guys where you either are entertained by him or you're not. You you either sort of get him or you don't. And if you don't, I don't think you'll hate the show by any stretch of the imagination. I just think you'll sort of be like, what's the big deal? Why do, why are people... I, I can imagine a subsection of people just being like, why are people even caring about this show at all? So the idea is it's just Jeff Goldblum being interested in a topic in each episode. In this first episode, he dives into the world of sneakers, people who buy really expensive rare sneakers and uh, people who show them off on YouTube and he goes to a convention at one point and he gets custom sneakers made. He goes and visits the people at Adidas and all kinds of different stuff like that. It's a sort of a... Um, he finds a subculture and then examines the subculture. But what's really more interesting than the content, unless you're really interested in sneakers, you may be interested in this particular episode. But what's more interesting than that is seeing Jeff Goldblum and the way that he is interested in these topics and the way that he interacts with other people is just really interesting and hilarious to me and a lot of other people. And he delivered that Jeff Goldblum thing that I was totally looking for. I feel like watching him do anything in person is sort of like especially in a, a context like this where he's investigating something he's interested in it's sort of like watching it's sort of like watching Willy Wonka tour somebody else's factory that's not his own he's just sort of this like eccentric a personality who is <laughs> people don't even really know how to react to him or what to do with him and i just find that super super amusing and interesting and uh i'll be interested to see what other topics are coming up for the world according to jeff goldblum like i said it's it's not a love it or hate it thing i can't imagine anybody actually hating this show but i can't imagine some people just being like i'm not that interested like i don't see what the big deal is i don't find i don't find jeff goldblum amusing and i'm not interested in these topics i could totally see that it might not be for everybody but i think anybody who sort of gets the jeff goldblum vibe and who who is entertained by that or um, finds him to be an interesting person will definitely like this show. It definitely delivers the, the Jeff Goldblum stuff. So that's all the original content that's not only that I watched today, but that exists on Disney Plus uh, right now, with the exception of The Mandalorian, the uh, original Christmas film Noel, and the uh, uh, live-action remake of Lady and the Tramp. Like I said, I will be doing totally separate videos for the three of those, and uh, probably dropping those tomorrow and in the coming days. And then whenever new episodes get dropped, probably sometime next week, I'll update these. If you would like me to go into in-depth in about any of these other shows or episodes in the future, let me know in the comments below. Thanks in advance for liking, commenting, and subscribing. Um, uh, give me any sort of comments or feedback about this if you find this interesting. If you want me to talk about certain things more or certain things less, let me know. I would uh, take constructive criticism or feedback in that way. I may not do exactly what you asked for, but I would, would take it under advisement. So um, with that being said, thanks as always for watching these. I know this ran long. I was trying to zip through those as quickly as I could, which is why I didn't go super in-depth, and I wanted to save The Mandalorian and stuff for another video. This is already nearing up on a 30, 45-minute video. So... Um, maybe I'll try to edit it down, but I don't know. Anyway, thanks as always for watching these. If you're enjoying this content, like I said, give me a thumbs up, give me a like, comment, and subscribe. I really appreciate it. And I will see you in the next one. Uh, if you're looking forward to the other content, um, besides the stuff I've highlighted in this video, you can do whatever you feel. Give this one a skip if you're interested. Anyway, thanks for watching this, and I'll be back in another video probably tomorrow or in the future talking about those other things. And as always, I hope you have a really great day. Bye-bye.